Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Central Church Online. Thank you for joining us for what is going to be an amazing episode. It has been an exciting week in the life of the church as some ministries for the first time since March of last year have started up again. But the Central News team are going to speak to you more about that later. But right now, in person and online, we have Willie Watt sharing with us on dreams and visions. It's exciting, it's an amazing, and it's an encouraging word that I'm excited for you guys to hear. So he's going to be sharing a bite-sized version of that word online with us today. But right now, he's just going to give us a little introduction to himself. Uh, my name is Willie Watt, and uh, I come from Inverlochy. I lived there, grew up there, so I lived there until I was married. Uh, and so, they say I'm a Belgar, but actually I'm a Cotner. How long have you been in ministry for? Probably a full-time ministry between 20 and 30 years, I think. I've never actually counted the number of years, but it's somewhere between that 20 and 30 years. But as other things, ministry too, that you're kind of serving God, all the time, and I've been in lots of different places: uh, Shetland, Lincoln, oh, lots of places. Down in England, down in Scotland, so lots of different places. What did you do before you were in ministry? I was a fisherman, a deep sea fisherman, and I really enjoyed that work, uh, working along with all the fishing. That's my dad was a fisherman, his dad was a fisherman, so it kind of it was an automatic thing for me. I became a fisherman, fisherman 15 years old, and until I really went into ministry. What's happening with life just now? Well, life is totally different right now. I retired from the ministry. I was in Hamilton in December, and I wondered what I was going to do. Thank you. Because I couldn't sit at home and do nothing. I thought I've got to do something. So. I did some refresher courses and I've used my, my skipper's ticket and I'm taking a boat now, guard duty to the wind farms. So I started that just a few months ago and I'm really enjoying it. So fisherman security guard? <laughs> kind, kind of that. <laughs> kind of that, yeah, yeah. Um, hi everybody and welcome to N Central News with me, Jackson and me, Victoria. It's great you could all come and join us today and we're looking forward to another great service. Remember we have two, ser we have two services, the 9.30am and the 11 so please book online so the team have an idea how many folk are going to turn up. Do you have a preference, Jackson? 9.30 or 11? Hmm, I think I prefer the 11 o'clock service. You came, why? Why? It's because I don't have to wait so long to get my dinner. Good point. We have another busy week ahead in church, so now it's time for... The, the announcements. announcements! This Tuesday, it it is a Zoom prayer meeting, so make sure you have your devices charged and ready to go. Life Groups is on a Thursday at 7.30 and this is the first week of the new Life Groups format. Oh, what do you mean new, Jackson? Explain to our audience what will be happening. Well, Life Groups will now be held at the church. It will be set up a little bit like Alpha, with tables around the hall. It's going to be a great chance to get to gain new folk. Sounds great. Yup, and if you can't get down to the in-person one, there's a life group on Zoom at 8 p.m. Oh, that's up a handy for folk. There is also Glow and Youth on a Friday night. Check out social media for details. Now it's time for Joke of the Week! Hey Victoria, do you want to claim the joke? Sure. Why did the M&M go to school? I don't know, why did the M&M go to school? To be a smart <laughs> <laughs> Oh well. Good one, Jackson. That's a wrap for Central News this week. Hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Bye! Bye.
now we're going to go into that time where we worship together. Now, maybe you've been coming to church for a while, or maybe you've never actually been into this building just here. You know, worship is a real important thing of why we gather together. You know, we believe that as we worship together, or as we, what may be perceived by new people as they come through the doors is a really strange version of karaoke where the lyrics are on the screen and we kind of sing along together to a live band. But what it is really is when we come together and when we lift up our God in worship, in singing, in, as a congregation or as a group of people, we believe that God's presence is here in the room. You know, God is here with us and we can't urge you enough to, to come along to church or, or maybe you're watching from a different country or different places to get involved in a church more local to you. But as you come here and you experience worship together, you know, we, we uh, are in something called God's presence and God is here with us. And we're about to sing a song or rather the, the youth worship team is going to sing a song for us called Psalm 23. And in a lot of our songs, our songs are directly taken from Bible lyrics. This song is originally done by a band called People and Songs. And as you can probably guess it, this song is from the verses in Psalm 23. So I just want to read you just the last section of that. And it's Psalm 23 verse 6 is this, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, when we lift up God in praise, you know, we experience his goodness, we experience his love, and we experience his faithfulness. So I want to encourage you, if you're at home just now, you can worship in your living room, in your bedroom, in the bathroom, wherever you're at just now, you can worship God. But also, you know, let's be a people who dwells in the house of the Lord. Hey, I hope you enjoy this, and thank you, youth worship team, for leading us in this song. Yeah. 
Thank you to the youth band for leading us in that song. If you're a young person, then you can find the youth band live here in church every Friday at quarter to eight. Now it's time to continue the episode with a Q&A from Dolly, and all the questions are submitted by you, the viewers, online via Instagram. And then following that, Fiona Buchan's going to be continuing our segment of We Are The Church, and then Willie Watt is going to be delivering his dreams and visions bite-sized sermon for us. Hello, my name's Paul Innes. I'm part of the church here at AOG Central. I am a chaplain down in the prisons in Glasgow, down in HMP Low Moss and HMP Barlany. Love what I do. I'm married to, to Julie and I've got two children, Joel and Hannah. The call to prison ministry for me was very clear. I remember I sort of I, was, I had left Teen Challenge, I was working for Teen Challenge and these young men were coming in, um, addicts who, who had been to prison and God just gave them a real burden for, for prison work and people in prison. So I used to, as part of my sort of devotional time, every morning I would pray for prisoners. I started off volunteering in Craig Inches in Aberdeen and uh, the prison through in Peterhead, so I would go through there. Uh, to Peterhead on a Tuesday night and uh, a Thursday night uh, I went to Craig Inches and sometimes went to the, the afternoon Bible study there as well. Absolutely loved it, loved kind of getting in about the, the prisoners, studying the Bible with them, chatting to them. Um, the very first time in fact that, that I was in prison, um, I went into, it was Peterhead on the Monday and Craig Inches on the Tuesday. And it was Barry Woodward um, who had asked me to come in. He, he had written his book, Once an Addict, and uh, he was going in there to, to do a talk. And it was Sonny Bray that was sponsoring the, the books that the prisoners were going to be given. So it was Gordon Cruden and Barry Woodward that asked me to go in with Barry and share my story. That was my sort of first experience of, of actually being in the prison. It was mental. Like in Peterhead, there was a big fight broke out at the, the end of the session. Totally freaked me out, but it was exciting as well because I hadn't seen a scrap for a few years. But after volunteering, the, the new jail opened in uh, Peterhead, HMP Grampian, brand new jail for men, women and young offenders. So 
we, well, I was still a volunteer, although the, the prisons in, in Peterhead and Aberdeen had closed, I was still a, a volunteer with Prison Fellowship. So when Grampian opened, we were in and we were volunteering on a Wednesday night did a Bible study group with the young offenders. Again, that was absolutely mental. Great times, great kind of Bible studies and different things with them. Within two or three months, I was offered some hours there. There were some hours came up and I, and I got a temporary contract there. I think that was 2013 or 2014. And uh, I took up some hours there and a temporary contract and got a few different sort of little contracts before getting my own hours within the prison. I did that for, for between sort of five and 15 hours a week um, alongside what I was doing at the Solid Rock. Absolutely loved it, loved kind of being in the prison, getting in about the prisoners, helping them, supporting them, laughing with them, crying with them, and just being there for them. Um, it was 2019, just two years ago yesterday that I started down in Glasgow. Um, again, absolutely love it down there. I'm in Low Moss four days a week. We've got 850 prisoners in there. And one day a week, I'm in Barlini, where we've got 1,250 prisoners just now. So it's a great experience, both massive prisons, very, very busy in ministry. So yeah, the call to, to prison ministry, I would say, was quite clear, but there was no sort of direct, audible voice of God, you must go to the prisons. It was just sort of a series of events. I, I didn't, God didn't sort of open doors and say, go walk this way, but just how things kind of, how circumstances were, how things kind of worked out, it was all very sort of clear, if you like. Loving difficult people is difficult sometimes. But I think for me, knowing where I was, like when I got saved or when sort of God started putting people in my path. People took time with me, loved me, cheered me on, encouraged me, uh, encouraged me to kind of fulfill God's plan for my life. So I know how difficult I was. So can I, I try and kind of be a bit more gracious with other people. But I think difficult people, you have to overwhelm them with love. You've got to love people and your language, and your actions, bless them. Do something nice for them. You know, we, we do different groups within the prisons with different sort of groups of prisoners, and some of them done appalling crimes. But I remember being in outreach in, in Peterhead many, many years ago, probably 12 years ago, and an old guy, David Stephen, a brethren guy, we were doing a group, and, and, and uh, it was Harvest Church at the time, and he, he said, Paul, look round about you. Look round the room. And I had a look round the room and he thumped the table really hard, he said. Christ died for every one of them. Look at him. Look at him, he said. And that's how I love difficult people. You sort of think he did. Christ died for every one of them. You know, this morning, if, if, if you're watching, he died for you. Like, no matter what you've done, where you've been, how much time you've let him do, he died for you. I love the verse in John's Gospel where sort of John the Baptist is speaking about Jesus and he's prophesying the coming of Jesus. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away all the sin of the world. Not just some of the sins of the world. All of the sin of the world. And I think we can get too caught up as well, perhaps, in dealing with difficult people that we'll forget about easygoing people. It's important that we spend some time with them as well. I remember my, my interview at Low Moss. I was totally freaked out. There was a panel of three people. There was the three, two, one. I remember my interview for the job at Low Moss in Berlin. It was in the Low Moss prison in this massive boardroom and I had to give a, a presentation, a 10 minute presentation on the differences between church and the community in chaplaincy in the prison. So, like, I had prepared this in Tenerife. We had just flown home for Tenerife, then the next day I had my interview. And I was thinking, I've no flashy PowerPoint, I've no pictures. I thought, oh, it'll be okay. So, I went through the, my, my presentation and, and were firing questions at me, and I was thinking, like, 
the woman, the, the chaplaincy woman, I thought, I think she's keen. The HR woman in the middle, I thought she's just here to make sure that I'm near BAM. But there was this gentleman who, who would have been, was potentially going to be my boss. And uh, like I couldn't quite suss him out and I thought, I need to drip feed him some personality. So during my presentation, the HR woman, she said, Paul, it might look while you're doing your presentation that we're, we're not listening. She said, but obviously we have to take notes and, and, and point score you on different things that you bring up during your, your presentation. So apologies if we appear a bit disengaged. And I said, no, no, I said, hey, that's fine. I said, uh, I'm a preacher, I'm used to preaching to disengaged crowds. So right there, the gentleman looked up and gave a little chuckle. And I thought, ooh, he's keen for a laugh. So kept kind of playing and, and, and the interview went on. So he said at the, the end of the interview, he said, now Paul, he said, you'll be glad to know this is one of our final questions. He said, what do you think chaplaincy brings to the prison that perhaps no other department does? And I thought for a minute and I said, a non-judgmental approach to the prisoner body. Uh-huh, he said, and I thought, oh man, he's needing a wee bit more. And I said, I believe there's good in absolutely everybody. I said, for some people, you'll find it with a little rake. I said, for other people, you need a JCB digger. But I'm a firm believer that there is good in absolutely everybody. Uh-huh, uh-huh, flipping out, he's wanting a bit more. And I said, think about Pinocchio. I said, Pinocchio's mom and dad couldn't have children, so Geppetto, being a carpenter, he builds his own boy. He builds Pinocchio. Pinocchio's perfect. He's the boy, he's everything that Geppetto and his wife would have wanted. He was perfect. He's growing up, it's great, and he starts going to school. And we see Pinocchio skipping on his way to school. He's got an apple in his hand, throws it in the air, catches it. I'm a good boy, he says. And he's going to school, and that's fine. But eventually, Honest John comes on the scene. And he's in Pinocchio's ear, and he's saying, come, come to Pleasure Island, it's great. And his conscience, Jiminy Cricket's on his shoulder, saying, no, don't go, don't go, keep being a good boy. I said, eventually, curiosity gets the better of Pinocchio. And we see Pinocchio sat on a little wooden three-legged stool with a big cigar. Whew. Not a care in the world. He's cracked it. Life's great. But of course, if you've seen Pinocchio, you'll know that the wheels started to fall off. He finds himself in absolute despair. He would do anything to go back and live with Geppetto and his mom. I said to, to the interview panel, I said, tell me something. Do you think that Pinocchio was a bad boy or do you think he was a good boy that made bad choices? And that is what the prisons all over Scotland are full of. Good people that have made bad choices. And I got the job. Good stuff. Obviously, I mean, the, the prison can be quite an intense place. At times there's lots going on, sometimes like you would have a cease movement if there's a fight going on or somebody's been attacked. Everybody just stops and, and, and you don't move until you get the green light to go. But I'll never forget some advice that our fearless leader, Ben Ritchie, gave me when, when I first started in the Solid Rock. He encouraged me to split my day into two parts. Not to let my day just roll into one full day of ministry, but to take a space, maybe an hour, at lunchtime and just try and kind of chill out a bit, go or whatever, whoever I'd been with, whoever I'd spoke to in the morning, and then go into the afternoon. So I've sort of kept that model all through my ministry, but I would say difficult environments, you have to be close to the Lord. For me, getting up that wee bit earlier in the morning, doing my reading, praying, sometimes praying on, on, on the way into the jail, but it helps me, it gives me, like I always pray every morning for insight. Lord, show me what's going on in people's lives. Help me, give me the words to say. Help me to help these people. Work can be tough, but I'll tell you what is very, very important. And if you're working in an in intense environment, knowing how to unwind. Knowing, like at the end of the day, to chill out, to lay your day down and pick something else up. It might be shooting people on Call of Duty. It might be going to Celtic Park, cheering on the hoops. 
maybe even going to Ibrox and cheering on Rangers. But whatever floats your boat, make sure that you're able to unwind. You know, I, when I'm down the road through the week, I live with a beautiful family, the Mutches and the McBrides, and they absolutely spoil my rotten. They make it easy for me to unwind, to chill out, to ask me, have you had a good day? All that sort of stuff. Having good people in your corner is key if you're working in an oppressive sort of environment. You have to get stuff off your chest. Like at the end of the day, maybe at bedtime, get on your knees beside your bed and just give your day to God. Maybe apologize to God for where you've got it wrong, to thank him when you've got it right. But for me, that is my sort of way of working in, in a hardcore sort of intense environment. And you've got to laugh as well, you know, throughout the day in the prison, you can imagine it's a great place. It's in Glasgow, it's full of banter. The patter is second to none. So there's always loads of laughs with, with officers and with the prisoners as well. So not to take things too seriously is key. Hello, I'm Fiona. Um, I live in Frisborough and I am married to Keith and have three grown-up children. Um, Lynn Marie, she's 25, uh, Joni is coming up for 22 and Cameron has just turned 16. Um, so I just want to share a bit about what church means to me when I started coming. And I have gone to church, um, I'm, should I say this, bit 45. <laughs> So it's a guts of 40 year because um, though my mum and dad didn't go to the church when I was young, my, they, they put me to the Sunday school. So I started going to Sunday school and I went to all the kids clubs, it was missionettes back then. Um, and I really made friends with the other girls that went and they've become lifelong friends, still in the church now, many of them. Um, my cousin, Alexander, and his wife, Lynn McLean, they took me along to the gospel on a Sunday night. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So at a young age, I wanted to join the tambourine band. This is showing my age. Um, so there was a big group of girls that sat where the just beside where the drums are now in the church and we had our tambourines and I was really proud of doing the tambourines um, we had our bony ribbons and I can still remember the tambourine, the routines that we did to some of the songs that were played and I just always, even at a young age, I must have been eight at that point maybe, seven, eight, I just loved going to church. I met Keith um, my husband at the youth and we got married um, in, in the church um, when I was just 18 at the time and then um, moved on to here and our family quite young so church has been part of my life um, for as long as I can remember being a child and it's, it's a massive part of my life um, after I had my kids, after I had my second child, um, I had postnatal depression. It was, it was after the first as well, but after the second, um, I, to, to kind of go back a wee bit, I sung a lot in church, very, very young, and um, I loved the singing, still love the singing, but after he, he and the kids, in Butlin, we feel into depression. I um, kind of withdrew for the church, really because I didn't want to be asked to sing and I didn't like saying no. I was never good at saying no. And um, it was easier not to go than, and, and I thought, well, it wasn't that I'd lost any of my faith or love for God, I just felt it easier not to go, I could carry this on at home. Um, I could read my Bible at home, I could listen to my music at home. I didn't really need to be in church. The other thing I felt was 
I didn't really want people to see how I was feeling because if you go back 25 years ago, we're more aware of anxiety and depression and mental health. It's, we're, we're encouraged to speak about these things, but back then it wasn't quite so much um, spoken about. So I didn't want people to see how I was feeling. And even I think now things are healthier because we do encourage people and the church also speaks a lot about mental health and things as well, where back then maybe it didn't. So there is a period of time within us 40 years that I've told you about that I was maybe near engaging in church and near with church. And to try in growing your faith um, at home on your own, it can be done for a wee bit, for, for a time, but you miss out on so much not being in, in God's house, because that's what church is to me, is God's house. Not being with like-minded people to build you up in your faith and to encourage you. And you just miss out on that fellowship. So I think that um, that was a mistake that I made. But as a young mom, and at that time, that's just how it was. So my faith in God is the center point of all the decisions that I make. Um, it's influenced my family life, it's influenced my, my marriage, my friendships, my relationships, the way I conduct myself. Um, far from perfect, none of us are perfect ever and do make mistakes, but God is the center of all things that, that can my finances, everything. So the church to me is, is God's house. So it's the center of my life really. Um, it's where I go to gather with like-minded people. I'm encouraged at church and strengthened at church, inspired, um, challenged as well. I love um, listening to the sermons. Um, the way you perceive things, your worldview, all these things can be challenged when you come under the Word of God, listening to a sermon. So I have got a wee verse that came to mind when I was thinking about this. Um, two seconds. It's in Hebrews 4 verse 12 and it says, For the Word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide in soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So I, I really feel that being in church, it continually challenges my perspective and sometimes a word can just pinpoint a bit something that I've been struggling with within myself. And I need to change my attitude about this or that. Um, so it builds up, builds me up. I feel church is a place for, we can encourage others. We can come alongside folk that are struggling. Um, we can feed off uh, folks' energy. And the, Ken, it's, it's a place that I love to be. Um, people speak about um, their church family. And to me, it is like a spiritual family. And some folk might think, ooh, family but folk like would see out about a gym a football club a workplace this is my work family my kin it's it's community and it's like a hub so it's nothing freaky kin um we worship father god and so we're spiritual spiritual family and there's a real sense of what and there's all kind of people there our ages and stages of life and we, we all have this common ground, our faith is a common ground and it's just amazing to be, to be in church. And the other verse that I thought on was Psalm 122 verse 1. So I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's something that I really missed um, during lockdown and things like that was actually going to be 
on a Sunday in church um, because my spirit gets lifted in church. I come out feeling so much better. It is something that I look forward to. So to encourage other people to come to church that are maybe unsure about it or have got a preconceived idea about it. A lot of people have. Folk care for each other in the church. It's not a place of judgment. It's not a place for you have to be can um, and top our thing all the time because we're real, we're real people, we're near robots and church embraces that as well. So I hope I can encourage you to come and just dip your toe in and see, see if it like before you think it's near for you. Well, good morning, welcome to Church Online. I would like to share God's word with you this morning. I'll tell you the background to what I'm going to say. I was in the boat last week and part of my daily reading, I'd read through the Old Testament and then I started the New Testament. So I was beginning at Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. And as I was reading, I, I, I read right at the end of chapter 1 that Joseph, and this is about the birth of Jesus, he, God warned him in a dream. And then in chapter 2, it says, the wise men, when they came to Jesus, it says, they warned, God warned the wise men in a dream. And another three times, it said in that same chapter that God warned Joseph in a dream. And I thought, oh, that's significant. I mean, I've read this hundreds of times, and it was five times in two chapters that God spoke in dreams. And then I thought, I'm going to look right through the Bible. And as I looked through it, I was many, many times where God spoke in dreams and visions. And then my question is this, can God speak to us today in dreams and visions? Well, I believe he can. Let me read, this is Joel chapter 2, and it's the last part of Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Then after doing all these things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit even on servants, men, and women alike. So we find the dreams and visions are biblical. They're in the Bible. Now, I have to emphasize this. They don't happen like this, very specific and dramatic, every five minutes. So sometimes they are. But there's other meanings to dreams and visions too, where they come and it's maybe just a like a little word inside. It's something someone has said. And you don't need to be sleeping to have a dream. We watched the Olympics a wee while ago, and, and people were fulfilling their dreams. So sometimes it's something little inside that begins to grow. Now I'm going to tell you about a dream that I once had. This is actual uh, Quite a lot of years ago, I was not long a pastor at the time. I was up in Shetland. And one of my elders, a really, really good man, his name is John Sales. And I don't normally use people's names online or like this, but I've got the family's permission to do that. His name was John Sales, a lovely man. And uh, he took ill with the flu. And uh, he'd been ill maybe a couple of weeks and I woke at five o'clock in the morning with a vivid, vivid dream. And I dreamt I was preaching at his funeral. And I could see all the people. I knew what I was saying. And it was not in our church in Bank Lane in Lerwick. It was in the Baptist church in Lerwick. And, and I woke from the dream and I was really, I was really disturbed. And I woke my wife Jane. I said, Jane... I've had a terrible dream about John. Uh, and I told her the dream. 
And she says, well, you, he's only got the flu. Your mind is, is racing. And she said, and even if something did happen, John's funeral would be in our place in Bank Lane in Lerwick. So I said, I says, aye, that's right. So I didn't tell her this part. I was disturbed by the dream, and I, I went downstairs, and I'll tell you what I did. I wrote down the sermon I was preaching in my dream. And anyway, a few weeks later, John wasn't getting better. He went to Aberdeen. They found out he had renal cancer, which is kidney, kidney cancer. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I never told anyone else the dream that I had. And anyway, John was getting more ill all the time, and I went to visit him once or twice a week, and we'd read the Bible together and pray together. And he said three weeks before he died, he says, Willie, in the event that I don't make it, I've got to plan my funeral. And I says, okay, John. And he, he told me the hymns that he wanted, and then he said, I know a lot of people here in Shetland, and he says, I think our place in Bank Lane is going to be too small. Could you ask Raymond Cowie, the Baptist minister, if we could use the Baptist church? And I knew. And I says, aye, that'll be okay, John. I never told him about the dream. And the day of the funeral, it was exactly what I saw in the dream, the balcony, the faces and the same sermon I preached in my dream, I preached at the funeral. So I'm telling you today, God can speak to us in dreams and visions. There was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Joseph. And as a young man, he was probably around about 17 years old at the time, he had two dreams. And in the dreams, he... he he saw his family, his elder brothers, mother and father, bowing down to him. And he told them the dream. And this is the Joseph that they speak about with the, the coat of many colors. It was that Joseph. He was his dad's favorite, and his brothers were really jealous of him. And, uh, and then after the dreams, they thought, oh, oh, he is so obnoxious, this brother of ours. And, and what they conspired and they, they threw him into a pit, and then they sold him to slave traders, and he was eventually sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. He was high up in the Egyptian ranks, and he became a slave to Potiphar. But God prospered him in Potiphar's house, but then there were false accusations made about Joseph. And I thought, where's my dream? That's must have been feeling. Where's the dream? How is this ever going to happen? But that dream was birthed by God. And so he went from Potiphar's house. He was thrown into prison. So that's, he was thrown in the pit. He's now thrown into prison. How can things get worse than this. How will I ever see the fulfillment of the dream? And as time went on in the prison, it was years. As time went on, there was a butler and a baker. They both had dreams while in prison. And God gave Joseph the ability to interpret the dreams. And so the butler, he was returned to service in Pharaoh. And uh, he completely forgot about Joseph in prison. It looked as though the dream was dead. That's what it looked like. It looked as though it was dying dead. But God was working out his plans and his purposes in Joseph's life, even when he couldn't see it. And so, one day Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had two dreams that really disturbed him. And as nobody could interpret the dreams, and the butler remembered, oh, oh, two years ago in prison, this guy, he interpreted my dream, and it was true. And so they called 
for Joseph, and now he ex is exalted, promoted to a higher rank, an official in the palace. So he'd been in the pit. He'd been in the prison, and now he was in the palace. Eventually, he saw the fulfillment of his dream where his family came when they were in great need and bowed down to him. In closing today, has God given you a dream? And you may seem, that dream seems millions of miles away. It may be like Joseph. He was dismissed. He seemed like insignificant. He was, he was forgotten. He was misunderstood. And maybe you feel a bit like that today. If God has given you a dream, you hold on to it. He will bring it to pass. I was thinking about some of the things around here in Fraserburgh that you will probably know. I was a solid rock cafe. When it started, someone had a dream. Teen Challenge up in Fivey. Somebody had a dream. Benaya. Somebody had a dream. And if God has given you a dream, you hold on to it. It will come to pass. Let me conclude by this. This is a famous man, Martin Luther King Jr. He had the speech called, I have a dream. And I would like to enclose and just to repeat wee bits of what he said. He said, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. And the dream was that one day racism would be abolished in the United States of America. Now I know it's not completely eliminated, but the laws were changed because of this man's dream. He went on to say, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley will be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. He went on to say, when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet and every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black, white, Jew, and Gentile, will be able to join hands and sing in the words, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on the 4th of April, 1968, at only the age of 39. They could kill the man, but they couldn't kill the dream. Don't let 
circumstances. Don't let things, it, they maybe appear right now, kill your dream. I pray that the Lord blesses you and helps you and you see the fulfillment of all the plans and purposes that God has for you. Thank you for watching. Well, I don't know about you, but I thought that was an amazing episode. Thank you to everyone who took part and made it so special. You may have seen that the church building is now well underway and there is now another opportunity for you to give into that. A small team of us here at church are heading up a Munro doing a half marathon in a few weeks time. So the fundraiser, the, the Just Given page is gonna be in the description for that, for you to give into. Uh, the people who are doing it is me, Matthew, Roger, uh, Johnny Strachan, Sam Moyer, um, I've never ran a half marathon, I've never walked up a Munro in my life, so that's what we're going to be doing to raise funds for this building. So please think about giving to that and praying to that. If anything said in today's service has impacted you and you would like to speak to someone, then please do not hesitate at all to get in contact with us. Our details are on screen at the moment. If you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to step into this journey of faith with us, then please in contact today. That's all from me. We'll see you next week.